I've got an interesting title for you. Winning with the hand you're dealt. Now, how is that interesting for you? You know, when people are hurting, uh, they don't need a simple answer. It's, it's one thing to say, well, you need to read the Bible, you need to pray, and so forth. You need more than that. You need to, we need to show you how to do that. And I'm going to try to do that today. Because for 17 years, we've given a good theological foundation for what we do. And my goal is to teach you the truth. And that takes effort to make sure we put it to today's life. But now, while we need straightforward answers, we're very complex people. Consider this. In Psalms 139, verse 14, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Now, guys, look over to your wife and whisper in her ear, you are wonderfully complex. <laughs> now, gentlemen, look over at the wife because she's going to tell you, you are very simple. <laughs> See, men have basically an off and on switch. And women have all these dials and complication things and systems and ways you're supposed to do it, you know, that we men don't understand, but they do. But we are all, by the way, complex in our own way. In Ecclesiastes 7:18, a person who fears God deals responsibly with all of reality, not just a piece of it. So we have to look at the whole picture of things. And unfortunately, we tend to look at just our little right here. God's got a much wider view than what we have. We just want our little answers here. But what we do affects other people, and they affect us. So I'm calling today winning with the hand you're dealt. And you say, well, why is all that? Because we don't have all the same talents. I always wanted to be a singer. Imagine that. Other people sing, I make noise. See, those that sing here sing really good, but they don't want to do what I do. They don't want to preach, they want to sing. But before I was called to preach, believe me, the most fearful thing for me was speaking in public. No way you're going to get me to do that. And then God said, it's your job, buddy, you got to do it. So you do. Uh, so we're not going to be judged by the opportunities we don't have, it's the opportunities we do have. And as we look at the parable of the talents, you know, he gave one ten, one five, one one. Okay? They were held accountable for how many they had, not what they didn't have. So they didn't walk up to the guy, Jesus didn't, you know, pulled into question the guy with just one because he just buried it and didn't do anything with it. He was wholly held accountable for one. He, Jesus didn't say, well, what did you do with the ten? Well, I didn't have ten, I only had one. Notice he only said, what did you do with the one? So God's not going to hold you accountable for what you don't have, but what you do have and how you use it. Now, we all have, we don't have the same backgrounds, and we don't have the same pains, do we? No. And we have different problems. You realize, I don't care how little or how much you have, you've got problems. And they, just, they show up all the time when you don't want them, and there they are. You've got to deal with them. And we don't have the same potential. In fact, sometimes we think somebody has a lot of potential and the end result they don't, and sometimes we think somebody has zero potential and they take off. I remember a, a family, I, I, there was a member of my church in Virginia, uh, the brother was always difficult in school, and he was smart, but he just didn't want to do it. And so he wound up working for a cable company, installing. Well, the sister was smart, too, but she wound up getting her R.N. degree. Well, the brother wound up owning an underground utility company 
and weighed no more than his sister who did all that good in school, who they thought had all the potential, and he had none, and he showed them, didn't he? And he was a very generous man. And was, he loved his sister. I mean, they all loved one another, but it was just watching what was going on, and you go, the one they thought didn't have potential had unlimited potential, and the other one did what she had with what she did and did it very well and took care of people. And so we tend to look on the outside and try to judge this or that. You know what? We don't have a clue. You realize that at the end of the day? You just don't know. Now, I want to give you five factors that influence your identity because who you are makes a big difference. Now, first of all is my chemistry. What makes up your chemistry? Your chromosomes, your DNA, your genes, your hormones, your chemical makeup. It makes up you. In Genesis 25, 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife, please, because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. You go, great, she can have twins. But there's a problem. But the two children struggled with each other in the womb. And they struggled with each other throughout their life. They just, you talk about sibling rivalry, they had it to the extreme. You realize some people are hypersensitive. I mean, any little thing comes up, oh, they get all stressed. You know, they're, they're the princess and the pea. I mean, they just, that's where they are. And you take somebody else who is, frankly, has a high tolerance for pain, then cut their toe off, put duct tape on it, go on the rest of the day, and at the end of the day they go, well, what happened to that toe? You know, it gets gone. Some people have low energy, and some people have high energy. I've got some friends, I call them 440 volts. I mean, they are run all the time. Uh, one of them, his initials are Faber McMullen. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, but he's always 440 volts all the time. Great, great guy. Good friend. He's, he's frankly a brother to me. Uh, you know, every one of us have structural weaknesses, and we have chemical weaknesses. When I was a kid, they tried to give me penicillin. It didn't work. That chemical didn't work in my body, so they had to give me myosin drugs. Now, they've improved penicillin, where if I need something like that for an infection, I can take that. But when I was a little baby, mm -mm, didn't work at all. So you don't know what chemicals work in your body or won't work or whatever until you're there. In Galatians 4, 13, surely remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. He says, you know, when I came to you and shared the good news, I was sick. I needed help. And I shared the good news and you took care of me. Now, in life, some people have to wear glasses. I didn't need to wear glasses until I was 46 years old. And a friend of mine was an optometrist. I was telling him when I'm in my 30s, I said, I don't ever need glasses, I'll be fine. He says, just you wait. One day, one day it'll hit you and you'll have to wear glasses. Well, that one day happened to me on a Sunday morning. And fortunately, I memorized my outline because I couldn't read anything because you're, it gets hard and it just won't work anymore. And so I made it through, but then I got glasses. Now, when I was in seminary, I had to, to study long periods of time. I got some readers. Because if I didn't have readers, I would get headaches. But only for heavy studying. When I, I could read the newspaper without any problem. I didn't have to need glasses for that, but after that Sunday, 46 years old, boom, there it was. So we don't know. I had a friend of mine that went to, he, he thought he had problems with his ears. And uh, he wasn't hearing like he used to. Come on in, enjoy. We want you here. Yeah. Don't have to sit in the back, sit wherever you want. You are wanted and loved in this place. Uh, I had a friend of mine that uh, went to an audiologist. He was unsure about how much he could hear. And so, and the audiologist was a friend of his. And so they put him in the booth, they did all their work, and afterwards his friend came out laughing. He said, what are you laughing about? He says, the frequency that you can't hear 
is your wife's voice. <laughs> he says, now, I have proof that I do listen. <laughs> it's just that one tone, they just couldn't, I guess he heard it so long they got tuned out or something, I don't know. But he had to make a, a work at it to make sure he could always hear his wife after that because then he knew what was going on. So that's two out of my chemistry. Second, my connections. Who am I connected to? Do you realize you have all kinds of connections through life? Yes, you have your family relations, but you have friends. And you, know, you get to know the people you, you do business with, just like the checkers at the grocery store. You wind up knowing their name and so forth. Um, that's one thing that's different from a big city to here. Uh, you, it's, it's hard to go to the grocery store here. Because you go there, and what happens? You, it may take you an hour because you start talking to people. You see this person, you see that person, and you've got to stop and talk to everybody. So it takes you longer to a grocery store here than in a big city, but you know what? I like it better here. Because you're not just uh, somebody passing through. Right. Now get this, Ecclesiastes 4.9. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Circle that, succeed. You help each other succeed in life. If one person falls, the other person can reach out and help, but the one who falls alone is in real trouble. So we're, we're a product of our relationships, and the primary relationship that affects us the most are when we're young. That's why it's so important when young ones uh, build them up, encourage them, give them a lot of love, even though they're driving you crazy, especially when they start walking, and then they start talking, and they ask you all these questions, and more questions, and more questions, because that's their job. Your job is provide information, you know, and discipline, you know, keep them in line. But if you don't get their attention until when, and when they're two years old, look out, they'll be monsters when they're teenagers. Got to get their attention when they're young. But self-esteem results primarily in those early relationships because it determines how you view yourself, how, how people view you. And so the most important relationships are those who you hold in the highest esteem, what they think of you. That makes a big difference. Now think about Jesus He's the one that accepts you unconditionally. Other people say, well, I love you if you do this, that, and the other. I love you if you bring in straight A's, but, you know, it's going to be a kind of a hard time if you get all these C's and B's. <laughs> Jesus loves you unconditionally. So that's the most important relationship. You know, Jesus was walking down the street one day and they asked him, well, what's life all about? And he answered, love. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And the second one is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So you love God and you love people. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 2, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a three-bred cord is not easily broken. I had a friend of mine, his, uh, John Mack. He was a major in the Newport News Police Department. He was right up head of the detective division. And he said, you know, Pastor, one officer can only keep one person in line. But if you get two officers there, they can handle a crowd. But one by itself can't do that. You have to have two sticking together to make a difference. And in your life, you've got to stick together with those you love that care for you. And be there for them. Be there for them. You realize we're all imperfect. You know, since we're imperfect, we don't have perfect relationships. You know, so we, we sometimes we say things we ought to somebody we love. In fact, sometimes we'll say something really stupid to somebody we love that we'd not say to somebody outside of the house. You realize that? Yeah, it kind of comes down over there. And sin disconnects us and causes damage on relationships. And, you know, it goes back to Adam and Eve. You know, what, what did Adam do when God said, hey, what's going on here? Well, that woman you gave me, well, she gave it to me. You know, blame. 
And then she goes, well, that serpent that you made over there, he, he, it's his fault. You know, we, get, we learn early on to blame others and not take responsibility ourselves. And one of the things we fear is rejection. That's one of the great things. We don't want to be rejected, so we try to fit in. And so it's part of our identity. So we look at chemistry and connections, but we also need to look at my circumstances. See, all of us have different circumstances. There's no people that have circumstances alike. It's like no two people are alike. In Matthew 5:45, in that way you'll be acting as true children of God, of your Father in heaven. Now you'll notice I've been speaking a lot about Jesus always addressed God as Father, and he reminds us here, our Father in heaven. For he gives us sunlight to both the evil and the good, and it sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Hmm. So sometimes we go, well, that bad person over there, they do wrong, and they're getting blessed. You know what? They can look at good people doing right, and they're being blessed. You can look at the good people. I remember when I was younger, I, there's people I didn't like too much. They were kind of mean, whatever. And they had a relative come from Alaska and build them a carport. And then that night, a big thunderstorm came through with a lot of wind. And I drove by their house the carport was on the ground. Fortunately, neither one of their cars was on the carport. And that thought jumps in my brain. Oh. <laughs> and God said, no. It just happens. It just happens. Don't tie the two. It's just, sir, okay, God. You know, because we want to run over that, and God says, no, that's my job, and that's not yours. So you, can, you don't choose your chemistry, you don't choose your connections, although when you get older you do choose who you want to be with and things like that. And we don't do to choose our circumstances. You know, our circ we don't know what's going to happen, you know, where I am right now, but you don't know where, you, you know, you may think right now you're going someplace to lunch and then it all changes, you go somewhere else to lunch. You, you don't know if you're going to drive home without any problems or somebody might decide to broadside you. Say, hey, we're here. We don't know the circumstances we'll face, but we know they'll come. And if you've ever been rejected, that affects you. And that's sometimes why we don't make friends like we should, because we're fear of rejecting them by them, and so we don't want to be rejected. So if you have a crisis or catastrophe or abuse, just know those leave scars in your identity, and you've got to work through those. But do not, you're a product of your past, but not a prisoner to it. So you don't go, well, this happened to me, so that's how I am. No. You're not a prisoner of it. So we've looked at chemi our chemistry, our connections, our circumstances, but now our consciousness. Mm, consciousness. Conscious means how you talk to yourself. Well, you talk to yourself all the time, you just don't say it out loud. When you start saying it out loud, you go, hmm, what's wrong with that person? Hmm, what's going on here? <laughs> Gotta watch them, you know. But we all, in our brain, going back and forth about stuff all the time. And you talk to yourself constantly. Now, frankly, the way you talk to yourself, you probably wouldn't talk to your friends like that because you probably wouldn't have any friends because we tend to be harsher on ourselves than anybody else. Yeah. And you know what the most likely person you're to lie to? Is yourself. Oh, yeah. That's, unfortunately, we do that. The Bible says what? The heart is deceitful. Got to watch it. So you lie to yourself more than anybody else. In Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So as you're thinking in your heart and your mind, that's what you become. 
So you need to choose your thoughts well. And when a thought runs up there that isn't supposed to be there, you deal with that right then. No, we're not going there. Because Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart, the way your emotions, your feelings are, is like a rudder of your life. And it can be really bad or really good. It depends on where you turn that rudder. person says, I, you know, I, I just can't, can't do it. Well, it's a choice. And you need to say, no, I am going to get over this with God's power. It's not willpower. Willpower, you know, you push, push, push against it, and then you give up. No, God's power can open doors that never, nobody else can. And sometimes we sabotage ourselves. You realize Job, in a way, sabotaged himself. Now, this is uh, not in your notes. This is extra. You write Job 3.25. Job 3.25. Job says this, What I've always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come to be. A self-fulfilling prophecy. He always worried that would happen, that would happen. He focused on that, and what happened? It happened. But, of course, it was in God's plan, and God gave him double back, but... That's what some people do. They sabotage themselves by worrying and worrying and fretting and getting upset what may or may happen. You know, what I find, most of the things we are worried about never happen. And we spend all this energy worrying about things, and what happens? We stress ourselves out. You can even cause yourself hives. You can have all type of physical problems because you are worried about something that you don't know whether it's happen or not. No, deal with the day. Tomorrow will take care of itself. The Bible says plan, yes, but quit this worrying because the Bible tells us over and over again, what? Do not worry. Don't worry. Mm. Fears can become reality if you let them grow, so don't do that. So look at our chemistry. That's our biology, who we are our connections, who we're connected to, our circumstances, and all, we all have different circumstances, and our consciousness, but five, and this is the fifth card, and this is the wild card, it's my choices. My choices. Hmm. Because we make good choices or bad choices, and we need to make sure God is giving us the wisdom to make good choices. In Genesis 2.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God says we were created what? In God's image. So we're different from all of other creation. We're created in the image of God. And what does that mean? We get to choose. We have a freedom for moral choices to choose to X or why. It's our choice. God made us in that image so we can have that. You realize angels don't have that choice. If they choose to rebel against God, there's no forgiveness, they're toast. But we have the freedom to choose. It can be the greatest blessing or the greatest curse. It depends on what you do with your choices. And because we make stupid choices, sometimes we get dumb results which we don't want. So that's not good. That's why Proverbs 2, verse 1, wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. So if you want to be kept safe, you make those wise choices. The good news is God, it's a wild card. And the wild card can change suit and number of any other card. And your choices determine how those come out. So that's good news. Now, ultimately, you're, you identify your choices, and it's a wild card that can change everything in your life. So let's, let me give you five winning choices. Since the wild card is the number five, I've got five choices under that that can help you accomplish a winning goal. First, I choose to get healthier. Hmm. I choose to get healthier. I don't care if you're handicapped. You can work on your 
light on your body. You can choose to be healthier. You can increase your energy. You can reduce the stress. I can eat better. You know what I found out this week? Uh, several years ago, I was told you need to try this cauliflower crust pizza. And, and I got the nerve to try it, and it was dreadful. <laughs> dreadful. But now this Friday, Andrea, I took the whole office to lunch, and Andrea ordered pizza, cauliflower pizza. With the, this other stuff's on top, so it's just crust as cauliflower. And it tasted great. It tasted like a good crust pizza. Not a floppy, not a deep thing, just good, good solid crust pizza. And it tasted great, so I ate healthier for part of my meal. Because I had lasagna first. <laughs> but then I ate healthy, right? So I changed there. So my doctor's told me I need to reduce, you know, he does as far as processed foods. Like, I love Velveeta cheese on nachos. Man, it's wonderful. He said, nah, not for you anymore, buddy. Watch out for breads. You used to eat a lot of breads. I eat just a little now. You know, they just hop in your mouth at times. You, just, you can't, that just happens. But I dramatically reduced the amount of that. And I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And the best fats are olive oil, pecans, and avocados. Those are the best fats. So, and I, I can't brag on this. My friend Rodney Ballard, who had a heart transplant before, he, after he got the transplant, he would walk 10 miles a day. Now, he's recently passed away, but had nothing to do with that. It's just have to do with the rejection medicine, and you wind up with cancer. A very godly man, a super guy, a good friend. But that guy would walk 10 miles a day. Okay, I walked three and a half, I walked three and a half miles yesterday, so I got some work to do. <laughs> Quit looking over here, DJ. <laughs> and so, but I'm working on it. I'm being healthier so that it take care of my body. So, so you, don't, you should have an Olympic body like mine, right? <laughs> it says you're supposed to laugh real bad there, real hard. No, now, DJ might have the Olympic body, but not me. Mm -mm. I'm, I'm working on keeping it healthier, though. In Psalms 119, verse 73, You made my body, Lord. Now give me sense to heed your laws. So we're supposed to make the right choices on what we eat and how we exercise. You can write this down. This is not in your notes. This is extra. Pain in your brain starts in your rear and wherever else. Yeah. It, pain in your brain starts with your rear end and wherever else. See, if we sit around too much, what happens? We run up with all these pains. And if we do stuff we shouldn't, we wind up with pains. Your back, your knee, whatever. Now, where do I start? I need to start on my relationships. Keep them healthy. I, I need to work on my own health. I need to work on my career. And I need to be stronger, the most important, in the Lord. Because he'll give me the wisdom on how to build good relationships. The wisdom on how to eat well how to work on my career better. You go to him. You know, the worst thing you can do is when you go home, get, t get badge out and just watch TV. No, you need to do things. Keep moving. So, I can choose to get healthier. And second, I can choose to deepen my relationships. Deepen my relationships. It's an intentional choice to work on relationships. Can you do better than you are right now? Yeah, we most all can do better with our relationships. And we choose to deepen those relationships. Now choose to be the person when somebody's health, you already know about and you're there to help them. And, and we can learn to be better communicators. You know, we're, we're, you realize we're all a work in progress. I don't care how old you are, what you've studied, you need to learn more. 
We need to work on having healthy responses back. You know, the, the attitude a lot of us have when somebody snaps at us, we want to snap right back. They're biting my head, I'm going to bite their head off. Now, there's a lady named Tony back here who is an incredible with dealing with people. Yes. And she handles that really well. So get to know Tony. She can teach you a lot. <laughs> because, you know, we, we, pre we need to practice how we respond, how we deal with people. Because uh, this is, I have learned through life, when you come up there yelling, screaming, holler, and you want something done, you get put on the end of the list. <laughs> and what I've learned, and be genuine about this, I need your help. Instead of blowing them up, you go, I need your help. That draws them into your need, and then you share what the need is, and how can we resolve this in a positive way? But you know what? That takes practice, it takes prayer, and it takes willing to do that, because the thing we want to do, we want to just, we want it done, want it done right now because it's done wrong. And we got to go take a deep breath and approach it more effectively. Because, you know, in life, when you go and blow up a bridge you're mad at, God has a way of doing that. Six months later, you got to go back over that bridge that you blew up. Now you got to work on building that bridge back that you blew up because you got mad at them. So don't blow up bridges, build bridges, stronger bridges, so you can work on these relationships. Now, why we have difficult relationships at times is we fear rejections. We don't want to be rejected so we don't build a relationship. No. That's where the fruit is. That's working with people, loving people, caring for them. And it's interesting. Awkward won't kill me. You know, sometimes when you're starting a new friendship or so, it sometimes feels awkward. You know, I don't want to do that. No, awkward won't kill you. Just work through it. Welcome to the human race. Yes. And the first John four eighteen. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. So when you really love and care what happens, it drives out that fear. You just do what needs to be done. You know, why does love drive out fear? Because you take the focus off you and you put it on someone else. When you keep the focus on here, what happens is you got a problem. Like you go to a meeting. And you think, well, everybody's thinking about me. You know, is there spinach between my teeth? Are my legs crossed appropriately? Is there toilet paper following me behind? How do I look? What's everybody else there thinking about me? No, they're not. They're thinking about how they look, how they appear, whether they got toilet paper behind them. That's a fallacy of adult parties at times. Worried about what everybody else is. Nobody's worried about you. They're worried about themselves. And so you need to say, ask them questions. Draw out of them instead of worrying about you to find out about them. Here, let me give you fear. F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. That's fear. And it's not real. So how do you get, get rid of fear? You move through the fear. You move against it. You go right against that fear and go right through it. You say, well, give me an example. What about Moses? Moses looks behind him and goes, hmm, there comes the Egyptian army. Looks ahead of him. There's a bunch of water. Looks back and goes, well, if we don't do something, we're going to die. So he says, okay, God, um, can you split the Red Sea? And the Red Sea didn't split until they started to walk across the water. And then it happened again. Joshua. Fortunately, the Egyptians weren't on the other side, but it was, they had to go to the Promised Land, and it was across the river, and it was at over flood stage. 
And when the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant started to cross over and to put their feet in the water, then the water went away, not before. You have to move against your fears, not run away from your fears. When you move forward, what happens? It vanishes. It goes away. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Let love be your highest goal. Love. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. He loved us. That's why we have a tomorrow. It's not about accomplishments, achievements, fame. It's about love. Make love your highest goal. You say, well, Pastor Max, you don't know my situation. I had my heart on a platter. They took it, stomped on it, tore it up, put it in a meat grinder, made it in a hammer of meat, and so I don't feel like loving anymore. Hmm. So, you let that pain go and you focus forward. Can you change the past? No. Can you change what somebody else did to you? No. And sometimes we think, we think about them, oh, I wish I could do this, that, that to them, and so forth. For, don't worry about them. You love and you move on from that. Move on. Show, let me ask you this. Show me in the Bible that says, if you get hurt, that you don't have to love somebody anymore. It's not there. You know, you can look all over the place, but it doesn't say you can't love because you've been hurt. You realize everybody has been hurt. Everybody has people that hadn't treated you right. Everybody has had bad circumstances. That's life. This is earth, this isn't heaven. But in heaven, God's will be done, but earth, we pray, it will be done sooner than later, right? Come on, Lord, come home, right? Come back to earth. You realize you're not allowed to not love. Love means risking connections. But you've got to get on that limb because that's where the fruit of life is. In Ephesians 3.17, I pray that Jesus will give you in your hearts by faith and that your life will be strong in love and be built on love. So you need to pray every day. Jesus, I want you to fill my heart with your love by faith. Fill me with your love so that others will see you as I share about them to them. So I want you to be healthier. I want you to have better relationships. And three, I want you to trust God. That's the third card, trusting God. I choose to trust God regardless of the circumstances. Well, you don't know my circumstances, Pastor. Well, I don't need to know. Because God knows your circumstances far better than I ever will. And trust God regardless of your circumstances. That gives you the identity nobody else can because you are a child of God. In Romans 8, 27 and 29, this is from the message translation, so it's a little lengthier, but I think more descriptive. God knows us far better than we know ourselves. You think that's true? Does God know you better than you know you? Yeah. But remember, we lie to ourselves. You know, God knows us totally. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Circle that, worked into something good. So even those bad circumstances we go through, God will use it for good. And you say, well, I don't know how. I don't know how either, but God does, and that's his job. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning, and he decided from the outside to shape the lives of those who love him. Circle, those who love him. Along the same lines as the life of his son. What is he doing? He's shaping us daily into the image of Jesus. The Son stands first in line of humanity he restored. We seek the original and intend the shape of our lives there in him. 
So it is his intent for us to live our lives a certain way. And he's molding us and shaping us with the circumstances and the trials of life to make us in the image of Jesus. So there is no wasted circumstance. God says, I can use that to help you. And Psalms 34, verse 1, I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. Now, this is one of the most important things you can get your mind on. I praise the Lord no matter what happens. Now, that gives you more confidence than Hollywood can ever give somebody, or Capitol Hill has, or a businessman has, or Wall Street has, because I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. He is my God, he's my sustainer, and he won't give up on me. So I have confidence in this. You know, give me your best shot. God's with me. Give me your best shot. I can handle it because God's going to help me handle it. So write this down again. I've told you this before, but as a good teacher, I'm going to tell you this again. I'm a, I'm a product of my past, but I'm not a prisoner to it. I'm a product of my past, but I'm not a prisoner to it. Now, of course, some of our past are great. And good things happen, but some of our past is, mm, we don't want that even out of the box. Although if you, when you confess and so forth, it's a lot easier and you move forward because it's not going to come out at the wrong time. You already got it out. But you're not a prisoner to what you've done in the past. You move on because you're a child of God. So I can choose to be healthier. I can choose to deepen my relationship. I can choose to trust God. And then my fourth card, I can choose what I think about. I can choose what I think about. I can't choose what other people think about me. Hmm. I, can't, I can't choose what other people do to me. It's, they, they choose what they're going to do. I choose what I'm going to do. But I can't change what they think. Now, your memories in your brain are in two different parts. Now, in the medulla, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but that's what the book said. It's where your bad memories, your painful memories, your shame, your guilt, anger, and embarrassment, that's all kept there. Another part of your brain is where the happy memories are, the joyful, the wonderful occasions, so forth. Now, they're never going to go away, but you can write over them. So you can write over those bad stuff and focus on the good stuff and not the bad stuff. Because I can choose what I think about. And when those old tapes jumps up, you go, mm, I'm not watching that old tape again. I've, I've already learned that lesson. I'm not going back there. I'm going to focus on the lesson I'm getting ready to do. You know, so you remember your victories and the celebrated things you did and how wonderful God blessed you. You focus on that. So you can create more memories. Now, your brain is like a roadway. And you can create new roadways in your brain. That's why repetition, like if you want to learn a new habit, you've got to do it over and over again about 21 times and it becomes a habit. But see, if you keep on doing it, it doesn't become just a little roadway, it becomes a deep valley in your brain. That's what you're doing in your life. And see, if you get in that valley and you're walking with God, what happens? You stay in that lane. You, you avoid going out of that because that's your lane you go in. So the more you think about it, the more you do it, what happens, the easier it becomes. Now, people used to think before the 20th century that you could not change how your brain was, how you thought. So if you, were, if you thought you were just a lousy person, that's just what you were. You couldn't change that. But there was a guy that won the 2002 Nobel Prize for neurobiology proved that an adult can rewrite his brain. He can change the way he thinks, and how you do that is with God's power, not your power. If you just try willpower, as I said earlier, you're going to get tired. You've got to rely on God's power to make a difference. You can change your brain. It is elastic. It's not a bunch of concrete. Although sometimes we think well, some people have concrete on their brain. You know, that's just that's what it is. And sometimes we have to look in the mirror. It's us! Oh. Romans 12, 2. 
don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. See, all they had to do was look in the Bible and it told us a long time ago. For science affirmed what was already in the Bible, you can change the way you think. Now, change the way you think is the word metamorphi from the Bible, from the Greek, I should say. It means to be transformed. It's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It went through metamorphosis and it changed to a butterfly. Well, you need to metamorphize your brain and come out to the other side as the butterfly of God serving him. Feeding, now how do you do that? You've got to feed your mind with truth. You realize musicians have it easy. They really do. They, they can pick songs they've sung before, and they can just do those same songs three or four times, just rearrange them, and a um, you know, preacher can't do that. You know, we've got to come up with a new message every week, and we might be able to repeat one in ten years. But even if we did it ten years ago, somebody go, even rewrote it, some people, oh, I've heard that before. <laughs> but you don't do that to musicians. They can do the same song last year. Oh, you sing that great. Oh, we want that again. Welcome to life. But so I've got to keep studying every week. And I've got two assistants that make sure I do it. And I keep on assigning to write my sermon, but th they won't do it. I just can't imagine why not Bob and Andrew won't write my, I mean, they're my assistants, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got it ready yet? <laughs> Where is it, Max, you know? Because I've got to do the sermon notes, because you have to do an outline first before you flesh out the message. So you've got to do an outline so you know where you're going. And so I've got to give that to them, and then I've got to finish writing the thing. And then I, but here's the problem. I write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Why? Because I keep on studying what God's saying to me, and I want to get it right. There's a guy named Daniel Amen. That's an interesting name. Good Christian man. He wrote a book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. It's a really good read. Because you change what's going into your mind, and what happens, what you do then changes. And so you make sure you're feeding on good stuff. Be around other Christians. You know, we, we need one another. And read appropriate things. Now we get down to the wild card. Remember the wild card, it can change the number, it can change the suit of everything else. So it's, it's not poker where, or, or spades or something like that, or rummy where it can, you know, you get a wild card and it fits in. No. God's wild card can change all the other cards. Because he's God and he can overrule everything unlike a deck of cards. So number five, I can choose Jesus as my savior. Now we're at the most important part. Because when you accept Jesus as your Savior, it changes everything else. So, if you want a lot of these things to happen, you've got to make that decision first. Now, it'll save you to heaven, and you keep from the place the Bible calls hell. It'll forgive your sins, and you're adopted into God's family. But here's the problem, and this is for guys more than ladies even, because we think, okay, I've done that Jesus thing, I've accepted Christ, I'm a saved, saved by grace, I'm a believer, great. Okay, I've gotten that thing done, now I need to go to the next thing. No, 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 no. The Bible says you're a babe in Christ. Okay? I don't care if you're 90 years old, you just got saved, you're a babe in Christ then the rest of your life is living out your beliefs and faith. And you know what? You've got to eat every day spiritual food. You can't just say, well, I'll show up every now and then at church and I'll get fed. No, no, no. This is the extra stuff Sunday morning. You've got to be doing it daily. Daily. So I'm not just talking about saving you from your sins and God's forgiveness because you've done that once you receive him. So make sure you make that decision today. I'm talking let Jesus make everyday changes in your life. Because I don't care. You know, remember this. You've never arrived. What does that mean? 
the Apostle Paul says, I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I'm reaching forward with everything within me to reach the goal of serving Christ. That's in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm going towards it. Why? Because every day God's got some more things we need to work on. You go, I thought I already passed that test. And he said, nope. And you think about if we fail the test with God, he'll just give it to us again. Well, I don't, oh, God doesn't grade on the curve, you realize. And he doesn't on the average. You know, like if you take classes, okay, you got a C, a B, and an A, and an F. Okay, well, the average is down, I got a B. God says, no, we got to work on that F. And we got to work on that C and that B because I want you to make A's. Thanks a bunch, God. And he will give you those tests and keep working on you. And you know what? If you think you've got it all together, the Bible says pride comes before the fall. And so what? You've got to go back to first base. <laughs> you've got to start all over again because you didn't learn a thing. Mm. So it's choosing to serve God, not your willpower, but God's power. What does God do? He tells us to put on the what? The helmet of salvation in Ephesians chapter 6. What do you need a helmet for? To protect your mind, protect your brain, protect your choices. Because your mind controls your life. You get to choose all kinds of things. Jesus did save you from sin, but he wants to save you from yourself. <laughs> How do you live every day? And 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When someone becomes a Christian, becomes a brand new person inside, he's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. You think you're waiting for God to change your life. No, God's waiting on you. Because he wants to change your life, but you've got to start doing some certain things. You may say, well, you know, I really want to get married. I want to live a healthier life. I want a different job. Okay. God says, I've got some things waiting on you, but I want you to start using me as your wild card to start changing your life. And the only way you change your life is walk with Jesus every day. I choose to be a blessing. I choose to bless other people. I choose to love others. You say, well, hey, Pastor, you don't know how old I am. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can change. It's a choice. So you can choose to use God's wild card and surrender Him every day of your life and let Him use those circumstances, use those relationships, use who you are, use your connections, use your biology, all to honor him. And what do you get by doing that? You get a really joyful, happy life that God says, I want you to have. You think it for a minute. The things that have brought you discomfort and unhappiness, generally, not always, some come from circumstances, stuff out of your control, but a lot of it is our own choices. And so we need to make sure we're making those wise choices so that we can be there when circumstances happen and somebody needs our love and care. What happens if we're there for them and we're caring for them? And God uses us to help others. So it's, and here, here's the thing. When you're serving others, you say, well, then I, I'm missing out. No, you're not missing out. Because God is going to make sure that you have what you're supposed to have. But if you're worried about you, you've missed it. What can you do for someone else? And do it daily. But remember, live healthier. Work on your connections. And each day, draw closer to Jesus and let him transform your life. Let's pray. God, I thank you for giving us a winning hand because you change everything. 
Help us to work on those connections that we have, the people that you bring into our lives, that we can be a blessing to them. Help us to trust you no matter what circumstances we face, because some circumstances are really difficult, but you help us. Help us to change the way we think. Help us to get rid of the past, get rid of things that draw us back, and focus on the blessings you brought us and the encouragement, and show us how we can be an encouragement and love others. And help us to choose Jesus as our Savior, for he alone can change our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for this time of invitation, inviting you to come to know Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you need prayer about something, but let's take a moment.